Well, it is a uh, privilege for me to be standing here this morning. I thank the brethren for inviting me to do this presentation. I'm no longer a, uh, a lecturer on this campus. I am now on sustentation. And it is my privilege to be able to present this paper to you this morning. My paper is entitled Preaching in the End Times. When one thinks of the end time and what it will be like, we will do well to remember the famous opening phrases from the famous work of Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. Jesus' description of the end time makes one believe that those famous opening phrases from Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities were never more appropriate <clears throat> than in the days just ahead of us. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. <laughs> the darkest time in all of history, as well as the brightest time for the people of God, lies just ahead of us. In fact, we are in it. It is a time of the end. It is a time of exciting possibilities of the next season that compels me to write this paper. As a member of the Practical Theological Society of South Africa and a member of the Societas Homiletica, that is the International Society of Homiletics, I write from my experience in the discipline of homiletics and liturgy. I wish to approach the subject from two homiletical perspectives. That of prophetic preaching and preaching the language of hope. In 2010, August 1 to 5, I presented a paper at Yale Divinity School. In particular, at the Conference of Society of Homiletics. There I met a lady, a professor, by the name of Leonora Tubbs Tisdale. She's a member of the Yale Divinity School. It was in the same year that she published her book, Prophetic Preaching, a pastoral approach. She makes the following statement in her acknowledgement. I pray that little Madeline will grow up in a world where the prophets are not afraid to raise their voices and where the vision of God's justice Peace and equality is proclaimed from the rooftops. Now, what is prophetic preaching? It is not always that the term prophetic is understood. The term prophetic has several connotations. Do you mean prophetic in the sense of foretelling or in the sense of foretelling. In trying to explain what prophetic preaching is, 
it will be good for us to look at a few definitions of what prophetic preaching is. Philip Wagerman, a Christian ethicist, gives a rather broad definition of prophetic preaching in his book, Speaking the Truth in Love. To be prophetic is not necessarily to be adversarial or even controversial. And I want us to remember this. The word in its Greek form refers to one who speaks on behalf of another. The word in its Greek form also speaks about one speaking for someone else. In the Hebrew tradition, a prophet is one who speaks for God. He goes on to say, what does it mean to speak for God? The prophet has a singular grasp of what God intends. And through the prophet, the people have a window into the reality of God and how the reality of God shaped and direct their existence. He cites James Russell from his poem where it says, For I believe the poets, it is they who utter wisdom from the central deep and listen to the inner flow of things, speak of the age out of eternity. This is exactly the job description of a prophet, says Wagaman. To speak for another, to grasp first the mind of the other. Genu genuine prophets and genuine prophetic preaching draws people into the reality of God in such a way that they cannot any longer be content with conventional wisdom and superficial existence. Professor Dorn Ottoni differentiates prophetic preaching from both a moral exhortation, from both and predicting the future of Jesus. She names three essential elements of prophetic preaching that can be discerned from considering Jesus' own prophetic words and deeds. Firstly, prophetic preaching voices God's passion for others. And yeah, I want to just say this. Prophetic preaching is not voicing the church's passion. It is voicing God's passion. And how often have I heard and listened to the voice of passion of others instead of God from the pulpit. You know, my students know how I feel about the preaching happening in Adventist churches. It, in fact, it's way below par. Because it does not consider the passion of God. It considers the passion of the speaker. It incarnates and gives voice to God's love for the world. Revealed in Jesus Christ and using the language of lament voices God's deep sorrow over evil and injustice. Secondly, prophetic preaching proclaims the promises of God. The prophet announces the coming reign of God which has already broken into our midst in Jesus Christ of Nazareth and gives assurance that God's promise 
of a new day of justice and peace and equality will surely come to pass. And thirdly, prophetic preaching points the way to new possibilities. Walter Brigham, an Old Testament scholar, in his book, The Prophetic Imagination, says, the task of prophetic ministry is to nurture and nourish and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. Then in Tisdale's book, she points out that Professor Cornell West, while not at not addressing in a specific manner prophetic preaching, he gives two important insights. Firstly, he reminds us that the prophet, prophetic witness is always bigger than preaching or the spoken word of God. Secondly, West reminds us that prophetic witness focuses on both personal and institutional evil. And this may be the last time you'll ask me to speak on something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Prophetic preaching must deal with institutional evil. It must deal with institutional wrong. particularly in our situation, just in case you think it's some other situation. It also has to deal, including the evil of being indifferent to personal and institutional evils. I might as well have my say, I might not have the opportunity to say it again. <laughs> we need to understand what prophetic preaching is about. It is not what I hear from the pulpit nowadays. Tisdale comments that there is no one definition that encapsulates the entire essence of the concept of prophetic preaching. However, she prefers to identify some important characteristics that makes proclamation prophetic. She identifies seven hallmarks of prophetic preaching. Number one, prophetic preaching is rooted in the biblical witness, both in the testimony of the Hebrew prophets of old and the words and the deeds of the prophet of Jesus of Nazareth. Number two, prophetic preaching is countercultural and challenges the status quo. It has to challenge the status quo. That is what the prophets did in the Old Testament. Challenge the status quo. We need to do that from the pulpit. Number three. Prophetic preaching is connected with evils and shortcomings of the present social order and is often more focused on corporate and public issues than on individual and personal concerns. Number four, prophetic preaching requires the preacher to name both what is not of God in the world, that's criticizing, and the new reality of God will bring to pass in the future, that is energizing. Number five, Prophetic preaching offers hope 
of a new day to come and the promise of liberation to God's oppressed people. Number six, prophetic preaching incites courage in its hearers and empowers them to work to change the social order. Inside and outside the church. Remember, inside and outside the church. Today we are dead scared to change the social order of what's going on inside. And there's a lot that I can say about that. <coughs> I've been in the work now for 45 years and I think I should know what's happening. Number seven, prophetic proclamation requires of the preacher a heart that breaks with the things that breaks God's heart. A passion for justice in the world. The imagination, the conviction and the courage to speak words from God. Humility and honesty in the preaching moment and a strong reliance on the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are going to preach prophetically, then all who preach must take the sufficiency of the scripture seriously and not to think that they can make the Bible relevant. This kind of thinking makes as much sense of trying to make water wet. <laughs> this kind of preaching must be scriptural based. Oh, my students will know that. It must be scripture centered and preaching is the only kind of preaching that makes sense then. It represents a high view of what? Of God's word. A high view of God's word. It must also be pointed out that prophetic preaching over the years have many faces. And Tisdale mentions that many pastors avoid or are fearful of becoming prophetic preachers. You know why. Because there's an executive committee. <laughs> but we can no longer Consider the executive committee if you're cons considering scripture. Scripture always comes above the executive committee. It's not what they say, it's what God says. In fact, there is a resistance to prophetic preaching. Uh, Tisdale explains the reasons for this resistance to prophetic preaching. And I will now mention each, however, not in great detail. And they are as follows. Number one, an inherited model of biblical interpretation that marginalizes the prophetic dimension of scripture. And some through their own biblical interpretation in preaching and teaching, relegated the prophetic text to the periphery of scripture, needless to say that there is that tendency today as well. Number two, partial concerns for their, for their parishioners. Walter Brigham readily acknowledges 
that the criticizing part of prophetic preaching often precedes the energizing part. And that such preaching can be difficult for hearers to embrace, which is true. The language of prophets of old used to criticize. They used to criticize the old order. And that was the language of grief and lament. I'm not sure we understand that today. The language of grief and lament in preaching. And as the prophet came to see the world through God's eyes, the prophet's own heart was broken by its injustice, inequality, and lack of peace. And the prophet shared that vision with the people who often did not want to be shaken out of their misconceptions of reality or told that the old order must die in order that the new order might begin. We are dead scared of that kind of thing. Dead scared of it. Number three, the fear of conflict. And this is most probably where the past is coming. I see some of them here. Don't worry, I'm not going to take you on. <laughs> Pastors are understandably worn down, worn out, and distracted by the many conflicts that must be mediated in ministry in these days. And thus it is partly for self-preservation that we avoid prophetic preaching. It's true. It's true. And I've been a pastor. I'm going to pass down my last pastorate. It was a, a pastorate of 15 churches. And I did a lot of babysitting. Because that is all I could do. Babysit. Mediating conflict takes an enormous amount of time and energy. And more conflict is not something most of us would like to take on voluntarily. I want to say it is equally true that while one wishes to avoid conflict, it is, it is good at times to come clean on the critical issues from the pulpit. We will do well to remember Ecclesiastes 3, verse 2. There's a time to break down and there's a time to, to build up. Appropriate timing is of the essence for both pastor and congregation. The punchline of the prophet was always something like this. Here is what God's going to do. So get your act together and avoid it. And so the prophet came not primarily to condemn people. He came to call out sin. But he came as an instrument of God's grace. There is no way we can speak about sin without speaking about God's grace. If you find anyone doing that, the sermon is flawed. Number four, we don't want to speak about, we don't want to use prophetic preaching for fear of dividing the congregation. Given the already conflicted realities, of the congregation these days, one of the things pastors fear most of in prophetic preaching 
is having their own congregations torn asunder by their preaching. And so what do they do? They don't preach prophetically. Leave it alone. Yes, we were babysitter. And while it is certainly true that prophetic witness can lead to division in the congregation, all after all, even Jesus said that he did not come to bring peace, but he came to bring us all. And if we understand that, if it is properly, we'll know what he meant by that. Number five. Now the reason why we don't preach prophetically is the fear of being disliked, rejected, or made to pay the price for being prophetic. Let's face it. I've been in this church for 45 years. You can pay a dear price. <laughs> you can pay a dear price for doing what God wants you to do. In short then, uh, sometimes it is when we are willing to go to the depths of fears and envisions the worst that may happen to us, facing those demons squarely in the face. That we also begin to find the God-given power to confront and ex ex exhaust them. Theologian Scott Bailey says, and he reminds us, that courage is not the absence of fear. Rather, courage, the capacity to do what is right and good in the face of fear. I'm just pausing because there's some things that you know you can't you can't always say. <laughs> uh, but I'm no longer in the work now. I can say what I like. <laughs> How can one become fear for preaching what God wants you to say? Where does the problem lie? Prophetic preaching is a must. We must come clean. We become courageous when we learn to live for something that is more important than our own safety. Francis Chan points out that in Old Testament, the prophets like Jeremiah experience deep rejection. Uh, there was a time that uh, I, I believed that they just didn't like my name. <laughs> but that was fine. I still have it. <laughs> How is it possible To preach the word of God and feel rejected. Why is this? Sir? It cannot happen in the end time. Mrs. White says the trumpet must have what? The trumpet must have what? The trumpet must have a certain sound. And if you need to blow the trumpet, blow it. Blow it. 
And so Jeremiah experienced deep rejection. And that pattern of rejection doesn't seem to change much in the New Testament. For instance, in Luke 6.26, Jesus says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. The false prophets were loved by everyone. And everyone spoke well of them. In verse 22 and 23, Jesus says that when they reject you, your reward is great. For that's what they did to the real prophets. <clears throat> Point number six. The feelings of inadequacy in addressing prophetic concerns. There was a time when pastors were among the most educated persons in their communities and when general knowledge was more prevalent than specialized knowledge. But such is no longer the case. Pastors increasingly find themselves addressing issues from the pulpit on which they are not nearly as well versed as some of the congregants. And consequently, they feel woefully inadequate even attempting to do so. We as pastors must understand and we must realize that there are people in our congregations with better knowledge on certain matters than we have. We don't know everything. And we are not right in everything. We must understand that God has given abilities to all in the congregation. And if we can understand that, then prophetic preaching will have a powerful manner of getting through to the people. Point number seven. Discouragement that our own prophetic witness is not making a difference. Some avoid prophetic preaching because they have tried to be faithful in preaching this way and have ended up discouraged. Frustrated and even defeated by the responses they have received. However, Tisdale reminds us that we are called to be faithful in ministry, not successful. So if we measure the fruit of prophetic witness by results that we can see we are very likely to be disappointed. But if we trust the fruits of God, who knows what harvest may be born of our labors. In concluding the section of my presentation, I wish to agree with this day who appropriately states, we have lost our will to preach prophetically because we have lost the prophetic vision that comes from being immediately connected with God and with God's will and with God's people. Yes, we need what Cushy and Long says. We need a bolder pulpit. Following you, remember this? I'm asking him because he bought me the book when he went to the States. He came back with the book, The Boulder Pulpit. Sometimes the prophets resorted to shock tactics to impress the mind of the hearers. I don't know how we're going to do this, but uh, they use shock tactics. 
Hosea marries a prostitute to show how unfaithful the people have become. Ezekiel eats food cooked over excrement to show people how defiled they've become. Jeremiah digs up a filthy, buried, unwashed undergarment to show how people, to show how people repulsive their behavior was. Now I want to deal with preaching as language of hope. I wish to go into the second section of, of this paper, preaching as language of hope. And this idea is not my own. I got it from a friend of mine, Professor Cus Foss, in the Practical Theological Department of Pretoria University. He's also a very proficient scholar in the Psalms and have published several books, particularly his book, Theopoetry of the Psalms. We traveled together for some time, uh, Cass and myself. Uh, we went to Denmark together. We traveled to London together. Um, tremendous man. Nice man to have as a friend. Foss makes the following observation when he says, people go to church with high expectations. They attend church services to be given hope, and although they are often let down by their expectations, they keep on going to church. You know, my students here who know every Monday morning I'll come, them, I'll come to class to tell them what happened in church on Sabbath. <laughs> and often I felt, but this is a fact. I went to church one Sabbath. Just let you know, I do go to church on Sabbath. <laughs> And I, um, we were looking for the church, my wife and I, and we, we walked in a bit late. And uh, they asked me to preach, and then I said, no, 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 let the person who must be, let that person preach, you know, it's fine. I can listen to somebody else preach. It's a dangerous thing. <laughs> And when the person was finished preaching, I turned to my wife and I said to her, there is no way we can be saved. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many things that we must do to be saved. And every time I thought he was finished preaching, he says, oh, is this one more thing. <laughs> and I said to my wife, we're not going to be saved. There's too many things we have to do. And so people go with a high expectation. They attend church services to be given hope. And although they are often let down by their expectations, they keep going to church. In our millennial sense, the sermon is the sheath of hope. The aim of the sermon is to, live, is to, is to deliver hope against all odds. It would be a terrible thing and, and an abusive experience 
If people are to attend church and listen to a prophetic sermon and thereafter leave without hope, without hope of salvation, without hope in God who provides that salvation, And brethren and sisters, many Sabbaths, when I'm finished listening to a sermon, I feel worse than when I came. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because we do not know how to handle God's word. We do not know how to handle God. I don't want to listen to your word. Give me God's word. You know, um, and you leave without hope. How can you leave church without hope? How is it possible? Hope is like a lily in muddy water. The lily flowers in this water, and like the lily, hope grows in distressful and muddy circumstances. Hope can exist in mud and can live off beauty. But hope also reminds us of our frailty. Hope conveys, hope conveys darkness and light. In Psalms 42, we hear the voice of someone who experienced his sojourn as though it were exile and chaos. This sojourn is one of threat and hostility. There's only one escape for the poet. When despair and fear descends on him, he yearns for God. And then he says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And the streams that the deer yearns for are mentioned again in the second stanza in verse 8. And the same intense yearning for God is evident in Psalms 84 verse 3. And this is also yearning for the living God. In verse 3 the poet asks, when shall I come and appear before God? And this question is one of uncertainty. As his doubt is heightened by the mocking of the enemy who mocks him by saying, where is your God? In verse 10. And the poet's enemies makes him feel as if God has deserted him. Most Sabbath. Sorry, my God that I serve deserts me. This thought comes through even stronger in verse in chapter 43, verse 2. Basically, chapter 42 and 43 is one psalm. If you look at it very carefully, the, all the refrains are the same. In chapter 43, verse 2, why have you rejected me? The scorn and despair are all the more painful to him because he feels that God has turned his back on him. He who is thirsty drowns because he does not experience God as his rock. God lets the waves wash over him and he has no one to hold on to. Psalms 43 verse 42 verse 7. 
Foss cogently points out that there is a movement in the psalm from yearning and desolation to fulfillment and hope and gratitude. Where there is hope, there is gratitude. And this movement is supported by faith. Faith enables one to appeal to God, vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against the ungodly nation. In Psalms 43 verse 1, the repetition of the request corresponds with send for thy light and your truth. The words, your light and your truth, contrast with the waves and the breakers in verse in Psalm 42 and verse 7. The light disperses fear and calamity. For the poet, this is the sign that God regards him with love and benevolence, and he has hope. This faith in God, which the poet hopes for and aspires to, is the faith experienced by God's people, which has also been experienced by individuals throughout history. God's loyalty is contrasted with his feelings of doubt. The doubt is replaced with hope. In this way, his long-awaited reality comes closer. And brethren and sisters, if in the end time people had no hope, they had nothing. There are strong homiletical impulses in Psalms 43, 42 and 43 which makes the sermon a vessel of hope. Those in the congregation bring their despair, they bring their anxiety, they bring their fear, they bring their doubt, they bring their sadness, they bring their uncertainty to the place of public worship. And if that is not satisfied, they live without hope. In the end time, we cannot live without hope. And some of the people have palaces, they have riches, but they are all strangers, they are all drifters. The theme of exile is continued in the New Testament. In 1 Peter 2, 11 and Hebrews 11, verse 3, the stranger, the pyrekos, is contrasted with the katoikoi, the permanent occupants of a country that have full citizenship. We, living in the end time, of the Parkoiroi. Park and as such, our citizenship is in heaven, where we expect our Savior and Jesus Christ to reside. And in the words of Nordmans, we are not ready for heaven. If we are not ready for heaven, we too late for earth. Our, our restlessness will continue until we find peace in the fatherland, the house of the father. And two of the most torturous feelings experienced by most people are loneliness and God's absence. In times of suffering, the scornful question is, where is your God? Will echo. It sometimes feels like God has turned his back on us. All that is left is the memory of encountering God in liturgy. I have seen and experienced him there. And the burning question in homiletics is about God. God must again have an identity, a face in the sermon. 
He must be experienced in the present. Homiletics must give God to us as a God of hope, not a hopeless God. And this can be achieved by encouraging the listener longing for God. The listener must experience a burning thirst for God. And then he says, why do we come to church on the Sabbath? <coughs> We're going to have to thirst for God. And if we're not thirsting for God, when the poet says, when shall I peer before him? If we don't come with a longing for God, like a heart that yearns for water brew, we're going to find it very difficult in a time of trouble and in the end time. <coughs> The listener must experience a burning thirst for God. God's light must shine through during the sermon and faith in Him must be like a rock. The sermon must have chased away chaos and darkness and must convince people to trust in God and to have hope in God. When a sermon succeeds in achieving this, a song of praise is sung for God as our helper. The homiletician must lead the congregation to the landscape of the New Testament where the question is, where is your God? And, and the echo comes back on the cross. The Christological depth of the sermon states, your God is on the cross. But he's there as your helper. He's there as your savior. He has been made to rise from the dead. To banish chaos and darkness. And from a neurological point of view, this homiletical perspective must make us realize that God is our paraclete, He's our comforter, He's our helper, He's our deliverer, our deliverer in hope. The house of the Father has much space to live and hope in abundance. Roman 8, 8 presents a framework for the sermon as a vessel of hope. In the context and experience of hopelessness, Christology and pubertology unlocks hope. Everyone who is in Christ has hope. A homiletical Christo Christology expands on Psalms 42 and 43 and Romans 8 and creates the perspective that there is hope in Christ. To be in Christ means to have a bond with Christ and trust in Him. He is our helper and the one who gives hope. A homiletical pneumatology opens a window to the entrance of the Holy Spirit on people and creation. The Holy Spirit gives hope in many different and surprising ways. He is the first gift to us. He makes creation and the believer sigh. And he too sighs. And the sermon comes to people whose ears sigh. And the sermon teaches people to live off the sighs, the sighs and hope. Woodley concurs that prophetic preaching brings hope to the listener. The tone of prophetic messages doesn't, doesn't have to seep with negativity. I want to repeat that. The tone of prophetic messages does not have to 
to, to see the negativity. Although it exposes the damage of sin, idolatry, or injustice, it also declares Christ's power to meet our deepest needs and transform society. Thus, prophetic preaching always leads to hope. Prophetic preaching never throws us back on ourselves, on our own resources. It always leads us to the Savior who can help us change. In conclusion, Christian prophets invite communities to hope against all hope. That God's new future is already impinging on present realities. And to become a prophet will require a radical commitment to what Brad Baxter calls righteous troublemaking. The agitation that results from speaking the truth in love. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Such troublemaking today and in biblical times stems not from a lack of love for our people, but for an abundance of love for them. To become such a prophet will require courage, the kind that grows out of a deep-rooted and faithful spirituality, for the prophetic preaching can be costly. Martin Luther King Jr. frequently likened his own persecution and imprisonment to that of the Apostle Paul, and also identified strongly with the suffering and the death and the death of Jesus, saw redemption possibilities even in his suffering. But in the strength of God, we empowered prophets from Amos and Jeremiah, from Micah to Jesus, offers us resurrection possibilities. Yes, all things are possible. Amen. Amen.